Hey everyone, my name is Adam Kling and I'm a character animator for the game Duelist. Today we're going to go over how to take this still image and turn it into a full attack animation. But first, let's talk about the character a little bit. This character is named The Scientist. He's named after the tournament player and streamer, The Scientist, and uh, was sort of helped designed by him. He's this sort of Dr. Manhattan type of character. Uh, he's got this blue skin and a sort of third eye or a crystal on his forehead. Around him we have this aura that's emitting particles, and finally we have these stones that are just floating in the air. From what I understand, these stones are superconductors, which are basically really strong magnets that can levitate. Now that we know what we're working with, let's get started. Okay, so the first step in doing an attack animation is to break up the character into layers. This step doesn't have to do with animating itself, but it's nonetheless very important. What layers do is it separates your image into multiple parts so that they don't interact with each other. You'll want to have enough layers so that you can move these different parts around without them messing up the other parts of the image, but not so many that you just spend half of your time searching for the right layer to edit. Alright, it's finally time to start animating. Our general strategy for animating is to get the whole animation fleshed out as quickly as possible. This way we can make sure that our animation isn't going to be terrible, and if we do find out that it's just not working, at least we found out sooner than later. With that in mind, we'll start drawing our keyframes. Now, keyframes are the foundation of your animation. They designate the main poses that your character is going to take. When drawing your keyframes, you cannot be scared to change perspectives of the character and completely redraw your design. It took me a long time to figure out that I'm allowed to draw a character's back or a different angle of their head. The more you do this, the more 3D your character is going to look. If the viewer sees more angles of your character, it'll better convince them that they're living in a 3D environment and not just a flat piece of paper. Okay, awesome. We have all of our keyframes roughed in and I'm pretty happy with these. So the concept of the attack is that he takes these stones, throws them all around the canvas, and then lights them up with electricity in a sort of triangle pattern. So on this keyframe, we have him winding up his throw, and then releasing. And then he does it again, and release. You might notice that the two keyframes here are actually just mirrored images of the other keyframes. This almost never happens that you can copy two frames directly, but in this case it actually works out pretty well since he's repeating the same action twice, just on two different sides. Then we have him on this next keyframe. This one's a little bit iffy. If you can't tell, his whole body is tilted so much that you're seeing him from a sort of top-down perspective almost like a Zelda game. It's not that this sort of perspective can't be done, but it's pretty unusual and it could be confusing to the viewer if it's not done correctly. So going on, I'll just want to be careful of this pose and make sure that it reads clearly to the viewer. Okay, so the next keyframe is of him releasing that wind up and throwing the last stone in position. Then he curls up into a sort of ball, getting ready for the blast of the attack. This is sort of the anticipation, and wham! He throws out his arms for the final part of the attack. This is where we're going to bring in the special effects, and he just sort of holds this pose while everything is electrocuting around him. And then he goes back to the original pose, because since this is an animation for a video game, it always has to loop into itself. Okay. So now that all the keyframes are roughed in, and keeping with the theme of fleshing out the animation quickly, we're going to move on to the rough version of the special effects. The most important part of animating any type of special effect is to understand how the effect works in real life. So let's talk about how lightning works, but purely from a visual standpoint. We don't necessarily need to know the science behind how it works, though sometimes that is helpful, we just need to observe how the lightning behaves. The first thing that we need to note is that lightning has no anticipation. When lightning strikes, it just seems like it appears in the sky and then fades away. The second thing to note is that lightning doesn't look like that zigzag yellow bolt that we all think of. It's actually much more smooth and curvy and is usually white or purple. And lastly, lightning doesn't really have any momentum or movement, it just sort of strikes and holds that position then fades away. Now this last one we're actually going to break, because giving lightning a small amount of movement makes the animation look more dynamic. But it's good to note that in reality, lightning doesn't bend and twist across the sky. 
Alright, so now we have our lightning special effects roughed in, and we combine it with our keyframe animation. Since we roughed everything in first, we can get a really good idea of how our animation is going to turn out in the end. To me this is looking pretty strong, so we're going to keep going with it. At this point, we're only about 2 hours into the animation process, so throwing this out and starting over again wouldn't be a huge deal if we really needed to, which is one of the strengths of this process. So now that we have the whole animation planned out, we can start cleaning up some of the keyframes. So we don't actually have progress footage for cleaning the keyframes, because I might have lost it, but that's okay. We're just going to compare the before and after of the rough and cleaned frames. There's really not too much to this step, it mainly relies on just calling on all of your pixel art knowledge and rendering out those rough images to a detailed sprite. The reasoning behind cleaning up the keyframes at this point in time instead of, say, moving forward and blocking in the in-betweens is that every other frame in this animation will rely on those keyframes. Almost every frame that is still needed in the animation is going to be an alteration of an existing keyframe. By rendering out the frames now, those alterations will be like sloppier version of those finished sprites, as opposed to if I hadn't rendered them out, the alterations would be like sloppier versions of an already sloppy sprite, which just turns the whole thing into a huge mess and you'll be spending way too much time cleaning up the animation than you really should. Our next step is to block in our in-betweens. This is the most animation-y part of the process, where things start to actually appear to move instead of just looking like a series of still images. If you have strong keyframes, putting in the in-betweens will be a lot easier, and if you're struggling on this part, it's probably because either one, you need better keyframes, or two, you just need more keyframes in general. Think of this step as connecting the dots. Drawing in your keyframes is like setting up the points, and now we just have to connect those points together. But how you connect those points is very important. This is where the concept of easy in and easy out comes into play. If you're familiar with animating, you've probably heard of this concept, but I like to think of it as a visual representation of inertia. Now inertia is the concept that an object with a large mass takes a lot of force to get moving. But once it starts moving, it takes a lot of force for it to come to a stop. The higher the mass, the harder it is for it to stop and start. In terms of animating, this means that depending on the weight of the object, it should have more frames of it just trying to pick up momentum than frames of it actually moving at full speed. It eases into the motion. Then when the object wants to stop moving, it needs more frames to show that it's decelerating, that it's putting on the brakes but can't quite stop yet it eases out of the motion. And this can be applied to almost anything, from swinging a massive sword to just waving your hand to say hello. Awesome, all the in-betweens are roughed in, so let's go over some of what we just talked about. Let's use this first action of him going into this sort of focus stance as an example. The differences between frame 1 and frame 2 is quite small as he's just starting to move. Then between frames 2 and frame 3, he moves quite a bit because he's already picked up some speed, and now that he's almost into position, he can start putting on the brakes and easing out of the movement. And notice how clean these frames look. They're basically done except for maybe a few minor adjustments. Since the two keys that we're moving between were already cleaned, the in-betweens hardly need any touch-ups. Another thing that Ease In and Ease Out can do for your animation is to show the intent of the character. Let's take a look at him throwing the stones into position. Okay, so he winds up and throws. Now how this frame of motion blur relates to the keyframe is really important. Notice how in this frame, he hasn't quite reached his destination yet. He still has a couple more inches to go before he hits that keyframe. Because of this, we know that on this frame, he's already starting to hit the brakes and ease into position. The pose that he makes in the next frame is his intended pose. That's the pose that he wants to be in. You might be thinking, yeah, no duh, that's the pose he's trying to make. He wouldn't stick his arm out like that if he wasn't. But let me show you an example of where this doesn't apply. And for this, we're going to take a look at another duelist character, Lady Locke. Okay, so on this animation, we have the wind up and then release and return back to position. The difference on how this blur frame relates to the keyframe is subtle, but very important. In this animation, she doesn't ease into her keyframe. She actually overshoots it and is pushed into position from the force of the attack. Sort of like striking a nail with a hammer, how the hammer bounces back up a bit from the force of the impact. 
This overshooting of the keyframe shows that she is absolutely not putting on the brakes to ease into the position. If she could, she would smash the ground in half with that big swinging disc. The pose that she's in isn't the one that she wants to take, it's the one that she has to take. When animating, overshooting your keyframe can give your motion some extra punch that'll make it feel just a bit stronger. Okay, so the next step is cleaning up the in-betweens. Uh, there's not too much to talk about on this step other than the technical pixel nitty gritty stuff, uh, but that's a whole nother base, so we're just not going to get into that. So instead we're just going to zoom right by this. And cool. Done. As you can see, there's not really too much of a difference. This step is necessary for polish and just making it look complete. It's just not super interesting. But hey, we're almost there. Next up, we have polishing up the special effects. Okay, so for lightning, I almost always use the same technique. The first two frames are very bright with lots of movement to emphasize the power and the intensity of the lightning strike. The two frames are sort of mirror images of each other. Not exact reflections because that look rather fake, but I just sort of eyeball what the reflection would look like. Gives it this sort of jolting feel and doing the reflection by hand makes it look more natural. After this, the lightning cools down and dissipates. Going about the dissipation frames is pretty simple but effective. After the second high intensity frame, I go to a blank slate and redraw the same bolt with a darker color. I try to do this with a sort of accurate inaccuracy. What I mean by that is that the two bolts shouldn't look exactly alike. I want the darker one to be just a hair off of the first one's position, and I want to be mindful of the direction that it's moving. I want to repeat the step again, and each time having the bolt become darker and thinner and moving in the same direction. Okay, so here we have the special effects added on top of our character animation. You can see here what I mean about the natural, not quite perfect reflection of the lightning. In the first frame, the lightning peaks up here, and then on the second, it flips and peaks down at the bottom. And again, we have a peak at the bottom, and then it switches and peaks at the top. This is what helps give the lightning bolt an extra bit of intensity that we need. Let's go up to our first dissipation frame. Now, notice how these frames are pretty similar. The shape of the lightning stays relatively the same, but we drop the brightness down a level and thinned out the lines. The same process happens on the next frame, and then the next frame after that until we're ready for the second lightning strike, which is pretty much the exact same process, so we don't need to repeat that. Okay, so now that we have the special effects done, we're really close to having this animation complete. If you remember, at the beginning of the video, the character had this glowing aura around him that sort of just disappeared whenever we started animating. So yeah, that's going to need to come back in. If you've played Duelist, you might notice that a good number of the characters have auras or are glowing or on fire or something like that. I actually really love this from a design standpoint. It gives the characters a unique look, but from an animation standpoint, it can be kind of tricky. During the animation, you want the focus to be on the movement of the character and not the glowing white around him. So we want to make sure that in the animation, the glowing aura doesn't distract the viewer from the movement. We'll do this by reducing the amount of particles coming off the character and keeping the brightness of the aura from overpowering the action. And with this, we're going to call the animation complete. There are a few steps that I left out in the interest of time, like the movement of the rocks and this sort of shake that he does while the special effects are going off. I'll put a download link to the animation in the description for anyone who wants to explore that on their own. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you might have learned something from this tutorial. If you have any questions or maybe disagreements about the video, please leave a comment below. If you'd like to keep up with animations or projects I'm working on, you can follow me on Twitter at AdamKlingPixel. Also a huge shout out to Globber Kotaki. He sprites all the amazing designs for the characters that I have the pleasure of animating. And if you haven't tried out Duelist yet, you really should give it a shot. You can download it for free at Duelist.com, I'll put a link in the description. Thanks everyone and have a nice day.